the Scottish Parliament election just around the corner, many people are keen to use both their votes to help further the cause of independence. I want to give you my own take on how best to do that. But first of all, it's important to take a step back and consider not just how the voting system works, but also the basic principles that underpin the system. I'll be taking a look at other voting systems around the world and explaining the little quirks that make ours different. Let me start by asking a question. What does democracy mean to you? Is it about electing a local representative to parliament who is directly accountable to the constituency that chose him or her? Or is it about every citizen having an equal say over who forms the government? Your answer might be, well, both of those things. But can you actually have both? It's not as simple as you might think. Consider how the voting system for Westminster works. It's obviously pretty good at providing local accountability. Every constituency has its very own MP. But the system is absolutely useless at giving everyone an equal say. I've just been to see Her Majesty the Queen and I will now form a majority Conservative government. Last year, David Cameron was elected to form a majority government on the basis of just 37% of the vote. Self-evidently, that means that 37% of people who wanted a Tory government ended up having a much, much bigger say than the 63% of people who voted against the Tory government. If, like me, you think that's a bit outrageous and not at all democratic, you'd probably much prefer the Israeli system, which has traditionally been about as close as you'll get anywhere in the world, to a pure proportional system. As long as you vote for a party that gets at least 3.25% of the vote across the country, you can be sure that your vote will count for just as much as everyone else's vote. If your favourite party gets 6% of the vote, it will get roughly 6% of the seats in Parliament. If it gets 80% of the vote, it will get roughly 80% of the seats. It really is that simple. And you might wonder how that's actually achieved. Well, basically, at every election, the entire nation of Israel becomes one giant constituency. The Israeli parliament has 120 members, so in a sense, this single mega constituency elects 120 people to represent it. Everyone votes for the preferred party, and those votes are converted into seats using the Dehont formula. You've probably heard of the Dehont formula because it's used in some elections in the UK, including Scottish Parliament elections. Now, Israel actually uses a slight variant on Dehont, but that doesn't make any real difference. It's just a different way of getting to the same outcome. So to avoid making this explanation more complicated than it needs to be, I'm just going to talk about Dehont in its most straightforward form. Dehont Classic, if you like. The way it works is that each seat is distributed individually. To calculate who has won any given seat, you look at the number of votes each party received across the country, and then divide it by the number of seats the party has already won, plus one. Let's think about how that would work for the very first seat. Suppose the Apple Party wins the popular vote with 30% of the vote, the Banana Party finishes second with 17%, and the Cucumber Party finishes third with 12%. Because nobody has won any seat so far, the votes won by all of the parties are divided by zero plus one, which is one. So basically, everybody is left with exactly the number of votes they started with. That means, of course, that the Apple Party is declared the winner of the first seat because it has the most votes. But when we move on to the second seat, the Apple Party now has one seat already under its belt. So that means its original vote has to be divided by one plus one, which is two. So its 30% of the vote is reduced to the equivalent of 15%. None of the other parties have any seats yet, so their votes remain unchanged. That means the Banana Party claims the second seat because its original 17% of the vote now outcounts the Apple Party's 15%. The snag for the Banana Party is that its vote is then divided by two when we make the calculation for the third seat, leaving it with only 8.5%. So, does that mean that the Cucumber Party is now in luck with its 12% of the vote? Well, unfortunately not, because the Apple Party is still there with its 15%. So the third seat goes to the Apple Party, which now has two seats to the Banana Party's one. The Apple Party's vote is then divided by three, two plus one, allowing the Cucumber Party to finally get lucky on the fourth seat. This process is repeated over and over again until every seat is allocated. In the case of Israel, that means 120 times. <laughs> 
but at the end of it all, you're left with a parliament that almost perfectly reflects how people actually voted. For me, that's what democracy is all about. There is, however, still a problem, and it's the opposite problem to the one we have in the UK. Suppose you're an Israeli citizen living in Tel Aviv, and you want to talk to your local MP about a problem with your child's school. Immediately you've got a dilemma, because there is no MP for Tel Aviv North or wherever. Instead, there are just 120 MPs representing the whole of Israel. You can pick one at random, but there's no guarantee that person will be of much help because they have no direct responsibility for your local area. This is where we begin to arrive at the logic for the voting system we use in Scotland. The parties that drew up the blueprint for the Scottish Parliament back in the 90s, basically Labour and the Liberal Democrats, were committed to having some sort of proportional system but they didn't want to throw away the direct constituency link that is traditional in the UK. Unfortunately, it's not possible to completely merge the plus points of the UK and Israeli systems. There's no way of having a parliament that is both proportional and entirely composed of representatives of single member constituencies. But there are a number of compromise or hybrid voting systems out there. And in the end, Labour and the Liberal Democrats took a close interest in the system that is used in Germany. We call it the Additional Member System, or AMS, but in some countries it's known as Mixed Member Proportional, which I think is a more helpful name because it gives you a better idea of what the system is supposed to do. Everyone in Germany has two votes. Half the seats in Parliament are single-member constituency seats, elected in exactly the same way as the seats at Westminster. The other half are elected from party lists, in a similar way to the Israeli system. Some people say that this makes AMS semi-proportional, but in fact, that description misses the point entirely. What actually happens is that the overall composition of Parliament is roughly proportional to how people vote on the party list ballots. This is achieved by distributing the list seats in a compensatory way to correct for any imbalance in the constituency results. If there aren't quite enough list seats available to make the overall results proportional, extra seats will even be awarded until the job is done. Well this sounds fantastic, doesn't it? In true better together style, it gives you the best of both worlds. 100% of the proportionality of the Israeli system and 50% of the local accountability of the Westminster system. Well, I'm sorry to have to break the bad news to you, but Scotland's own version of AMS doesn't work quite as well as that. Labour were, of course, in the driving seat when the crucial decisions were made, and they were only keen on proportional representation up to a point. They actually quite fancied the idea of having more Labour seats in the Scottish Parliament than their vote would really justify. So in contrast to the 50-50 split in Germany, they insisted that there would have to be more constituency seats than list seats. They originally wanted a ratio of 73 to 40, but after a compromise with the Liberal Democrats, we eventually ended up with a ratio of 73 to 56. And there was certainly never any question of extra list seats being awarded if that was needed to make sure the result was fully proportional. The list seats are also awarded on a regional rather than a national basis, which in practice makes full proportionality even less likely. Think about an electoral region like Glasgow, which used to have 17 seats overall, 10 constituency, seven list. In 1999, Labour won all 10 constituency seats, but took well under 50% of the vote on the regional list ballot. The de Haunt formula did its best to balance things out. When the list seats were distributed, Labour's vote was divided by 11, 10 plus 1, meaning that the opposition parties won all of the seven list seats. But seven just wasn't enough to do the trick. That still left Labour with 10 out of the 17 Glasgow seats, which was far more than their share of the vote justified. In effect, they got bonus seats from Glasgow, as they did from other regions where their support was strongest. But in regions where they were weaker, they still won their fair share of seats, meaning that they ended up significantly overrepresented in the Parliament, 43% of the seats in spite of winning only 35% of the list vote. So fast forward the best part of two decades, and Labour dominance has been replaced by SNP dominance, which means, paradoxically, that it's the SNP who are now benefiting from the limitations Labour so carefully built into the system.
The difference is, though, that instead of winning the 53 constituency seats that Labour won in 1999, some people think the SNP could win more than 65 this year, which means they would be guaranteed an overall majority before a single list seat is declared. And that's given rise to a stubborn belief among some supporters of independence that there is a bug in the system that can be exploited to vastly increase the number of pro-independence MSPs. So the theory goes like this. Suppose the SNP win 55% of the constituency vote and take 69 out of the 73 constituency seats. And then suppose the vast bulk of SNP voters switch en masse to the Greens on the list ballot, leaving the SNP with 10% of the list vote and the Greens with 45%. The Dehaunt formula will do its very best to bring the overall result into line with how people voted on the list, but with only 56 list seats to play with across the country, it can't possibly succeed. The SNP will end up with 69 out of the 129 seats overall, which is around 53%, in spite of the fact that they should only be entitled to 10%. And of course, there won't be enough list seats to bring the Greens up to the 45% they should be entitled to either. But what will happen is that the Greens will take perhaps three or four seats in each electoral region, which will crowd out the Unionist parties and leave Labour, the Tories and the Lib Dems with far fewer MSPs than the Unionist vote would justify. It's a way of getting ourselves a parliament that is totally dominated by pro-independence MSPs, even though only a relatively slender majority of voters actually back pro-independence parties. Essentially, it's a cheat, albeit one that's allowed by the rules Labour gave us. Now, I dare say you're thinking that if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And I'm afraid you're right. Just think about what you'd need to know in advance if this tactic was actually going to work without any risk of it seriously backfiring. First of all, if you're an SNP supporter, you'd need to know for sure that the SNP really are going to win at least 65 constituency seats. You might think you do know that from opinion polls, but you don't. Opinion polls don't predict election results, they're simply snapshots of public opinion in advance of an election. And they're not necessarily accurate snapshots. And even if it were possible to say for certain that the SNP are going to win, say, 51% of the constituency vote, you still wouldn't know how many seats that might translate into. It would depend on the geographical distribution of votes and also on the extent of anti-SNP tactical voting in certain close-fought seats. And something else to remember. On election night last year, the exit poll suggested that the Liberal Democrats would win 10 seats. But a YouGov poll on the day suggested that they would win 31. The exit poll turned out to be more or less right, but the instinctive reaction of many commentators was that the YouGov figures seemed more plausible. If that's the type of uncertainty we often face after voting is already over, what possible hope have we got of knowing in advance the result of 73 individual constituency elections at the moment we cast our votes? If the SNP fall even slightly short of that magic figure of 65 constituency seats, they're going to desperately need less votes. And if their own supporters have abandoned them on the list because they wrongly thought their votes weren't needed, that could have a devastating effect. But let's suppose for the sake of argument that you somehow do know for sure that the SNP are going to get 65. The second important thing you would need to know is that enough of your fellow pro-independence voters are actually joining you and switching to a different party on the list, because the tactic won't work unless they do. In reality, the idea that hundreds of thousands of SNP constituency voters can be persuaded to switch tactically to the Greens, let alone to smaller parties like Solidarity or Rise, is in the realms of fantasy, unless someone can invent a mind control ray. So at a minimum, it's vital to know that you're at least switching to a party that's going to win at least one list seat in your region. The threshold for doing that is usually around 5% or 6% of the vote. Unfortunately, opinion polls aren't much help on this point either. In both of the last two elections, the Greens seemed set for a breakthrough, but when the votes were counted, it turned out that they had been significantly overestimated by the polls, and they failed to win a seat in six out of the eight regions. If you had switched tactically to the Greens in one of those regions, your list vote would have been completely wasted, or perhaps even worse. Well, that the uh, North East Regional list vote result uh, confirming the members that have been elected in that region, uh, there they are in the order in which they were elected. In the North East region in 2011, 
Some SNP supporters did switch tactically to the Greens on the list, thinking that the SNP couldn't possibly win any list seats because they would win too many constituency seats. But that assumption was completely wrong. The SNP won one list seat in spite of winning every single constituency seat, and the Greens fell short of the threshold. The tactical votes almost backfired horrendously. If just 2,000 more SNP voters had switched to the Greens and 600 more had switched to the SSP, the final list seat in the region would have been won by the Tories rather than the SNP, and the pro-independence majority in Parliament would have been smaller. And this is the whole trouble. We're not really talking about tactical voting here, but about gambling voting. As with any flutter, you can expect to lose your stake if you guess incorrectly. In this case, the stake is the overall SNP majority, and possibly even the pro-independence majority. Is that really worth putting at risk for a very small outside chance of getting the lovely bonus of a couple of dozen extra pro-independence MSPs? My own view is that it definitely isn't. It's having a pro-independence majority that matters. There's very little we could do with 89 seats that we couldn't do with 69. But there's a great deal we could do with 69 that we couldn't do with 63. Yes, there's a potential bug in the system. The list vote is supposed to be the more important vote, but it could turn out to be a sideshow if the SNP win a majority on constituency seats alone. But in the absence of a crystal ball, I'm going to stick to using the system as nature intended. The list vote is the banker vote. You can be sure it will count if your party needs it. If you're tempted to take a punt by voting for your second choice party on the list, my suggestion is to try to imagine how you'll feel on the morning of May the 6th if the pro-independence majority is gone and it's too late to do anything about it. This election isn't a game, and I don't want us to roll the dice on the future of our country. <laughs>